Walking on hot embers is becoming all the rage. And judging by a huge number of YouTube videos, firewalkers rarely get burns. Aficionados of the fiery practice explain this by supernatural powers. I decided to find out firsthand what's prevailing here, physics or mysticism. To help us with the experiment, we invited a person who not only walks on coals himself, but also teaches anyone who's eager to learn. Alexander Blagov, author and facilitator of several courses on overcoming fear. Sasha, you teach people how to walk on hot embers. I'm curious, why would people need to do that at all? I think everyone gets something different out of it. I mean, someone needs it to become confident in his strength. Someone needs it to break the monotony of life, to get new experiences and new emotions. And some people do it to get into a warrior state, which is to build up confidence and drive for achieving their goals. It's all very nice, and you say very inspiring words, but what I would like to know is whether it's more scary than painful, or is it more painful than scary? It's more scarier than painful. So in the first place, it's about overcoming the mental barriers. Yes. In the first place, it means overcoming your mental barriers and smashing your stereotypes. I'm really interested. What do I have to do to walk on coals and not burn my heels? Well, first and foremost, you have to believe that you can do it without burning yourself. So if I don't believe in it, if I'm afraid when I start, then I won't succeed. Put it like this. The probability of you burning yourself rapidly increases if you don't believe, if you're scared and closed up. If you're absolutely confident and you trust yourself, then you just go at it head on and it usually works. Well, at your request, we prepared lots of firewood. How much time does it take to burn them all and why can't we use pre-packed charcoal? Why did you ask us to prepare all these logs? You know, it's not that we are absolutely set on not using charcoal, but so this mystical component, like it should only be the firewood that you prepared, chopped and stacked yourself, all of that is nonsense. It's a process. Every walk on embers is a process with several stages. And preparing fire helps you get into the right mood and mental state. It's really very important. Cool, Mish is chopping wood. Mish will do the walking, awesome, hallelujah. Mish, did you hear that? You will do the fire walking. I did that once and I won't do it again, but you should try again. Fine, I guess I'll have to face the music. While the coals are getting ready, I'd like to show you one experiment that demonstrates the physical processes behind firewalking. This is a regular cigarette. The temperature of its smoldering tip. I'll show it to you. The temperature of its smoldering tip is more than 390 degrees Celsius. Now I'll do this. I didn't get any burns on my fingertips. The reason is that I used a little trick. Before the experiment, I held a piece of ice in my hands to lower my skin temperature. So the heat of the cigarette butt wasn't enough to give me a burn. The same principle should work with hot embers. Our body's thermal capacity is quite big, so a lot of energy is required to heat it up. If the contact with coals is short, our skin won't have time to heat and consequently get burned. Well, at least in theory. Sasha, I'm basically clearer on the physics of it. What about the psychological state? How important is it for firewalking? 
I think it's the main thing. It's the most important factor. If you don't get into a proper mental state, if you have fear, it's very dangerous to do. Why? Because at some point, you might draw in your toes, for example, or make a wrong step. And in this moment, you will get burned. Well, it's easy to say that, but I'll have to risk my own feet, not someone else's. Well, you can risk your fingers first. You mean sticking my fingers in fire? No, we have a special practice. We have everything ready for it. Dipping fingers into molten lead. I thought you were making tea. Oh, it's a bit denser. The act we are going to perform right now is actually based on a very simple trick. Well, if you can call it that. It has one goal, to show a person that he isn't prepared mentally for some situations in life, although he might be telling himself that he is. So you have to watch your internal reactions when you do this. Because first, you will put your fingers in water and then in molten lead. And right before the lead part, your body will order you to stop. Yes, it's a barrier, and it happens very often. Nine times out of ten, our body resists our mind. Our mind says, do it. And our body says, don't, stop. And this psychological moment of overcoming yourself, of pushing yourself gently without brute force is very important in realizing that your mental barriers and your understanding of your capabilities sometimes are not in touch with reality. So I should forget about my self-preservation instinct, turn it off and do something that will cause me a throbbing pain, but most likely also uh, a severe burn. I think that in this moment, it's not the self-preservation instinct that you forget. It's the fear inside you, because the self-preservation instinct gives us power and fear takes it away. That's the essential difference between them. Have you ever done it yourself? Will I keep my fingers? I came here with this idea to try it with you. I'm doing it for the first time. <laughs> Thank you. So the temperature of the lead is 313 degrees Celsius. We take our two fingers, maybe it's better to go with just one, two fingers, simply dip them and touch the bottom. How is it? It's a bit deeper than one knuckle. It's more than enough. My arms are fine. They're not even hot. Oh dear. Did you go to the bottom? To the bottom, yes. I have this urge to keep doing something to de delay this moment of dipping my fingers. Oh my, oh dear, oh. <laughs> I can't help myself. You just have to go ahead and do it. Don't think. Turn off your consciousness. Turn off your brain. Just go ahead and do it. That's it. Without thinking, as soon as you start thinking, working yourself up, suddenly it's a very difficult thing to do. You become scared. Dip your hand. First dip it in water, take it out, and dip it in lead. And you really touch the bottom. I did. Yes, water first. 
Don't forget about it. <laughs> awesome. Make it smooth and calm now. No splashing. Don't hurry. Carefully. First water, then here. Now you know that it's not so scary. Just like that. That's it. Nothing magical about it. What's difficult is to make the movement against this urge that you get when you see your body in molten metal. It is indeed very difficult and scary. That's the secret of overcoming any fear. Because this moment when you are afraid of dipping your hand is just the same as when you are scared to start a conversation with a beautiful girl or talk to your boss about a raise. Well, that's not so scary, to be honest. Well, there can be other moments. People are diverse, after all. Everyone has fears. And this is about the moment when you just go for it. So I walk on the street, see a beautiful girl, pour some lead, do this thing, and then, hi, what's your name? Like that? Something like that. You just have to remember the water part. Well, I have a bit more confidence now. I'm looking forward to these embers now. Right, you're going to get even more confidence. Today, we are going to fry eggs using pyrotechnics. This powder here is called white flare. It is used to imitate flashes that you see in movies when soldiers are running into attack and something has to burn and flare in the background. It burns at a temperature of roughly 1,000 to 1,500 degrees Celsius. We will try to fry some eggs and our task is to find out how much of this stuff we need to make the eggs nice and fried, yet not to burn them. Let's start with a small amount. Here we have about 60 grams of this wonderful powder. Would you like it sunny side up? Sunny side up it is. So, should we go? So. This amount is obviously not enough. Our eggs are quite runny. But it's not a big deal. We'll keep on trying. We have more eggs in frying pans. 60 grams didn't do the job, so we are taking a 200 gram charge. We have 200 grams of white flare, is the name of this pyrotechnical compound, and two fried eggs sunny side up. Guys, I think the eggs got burned. It's too much this time. Well, it means that to fry eggs, you need somewhere between 60 and 200 grams of this powder. I think it's very visual. Let's go!
You have to get your feet nice and warm. Why do we have to do that? How does that help? Ouch. Hot. The temperature in our feet is rising. I guess when our feet are warm, they have a, a better blood supply. And at the same time, heat removal becomes better because the blood circulating in vessels takes the extra heat away faster. Exactly. So if I warm my feet good enough, my heels will start sweating. And, and it will basically be the same as with dipping my fingers in lead. Actually, no, the process is inverted. Your feet have to be dry because your feet stay on a hot surface for a real long time. And vaporizing can become another risk factor for getting burnt. That's why you have to make sure your feet are dry. It's better like that. I have everything baked down there, only where it shouldn't be. Put some more over here. I just shovel more. Why are you packing it? What's it for? To make an even surface. If there will be pieces sticking out, you won't get a tight contact with the ground. And it's the most important point to press your foot firmly so that there won't be a layer of oxygen between the coals and your feet. I thought that oxygen is a good thermal insulator. Oxygen allows fire to burn. And this way, we stop the burning process for a moment. That gives us a possibility to walk on embers without any consequences. Just to show you that we are not cheating. Ah, my hands are burning. 489, 490, 500. Sasha, it's more than 500, more than 500 degrees. Are you sure? I'm sure. I'm not anymore. I'll go ahead. You're first. Well, to strengthen my confidence and to achieve my life goals. Here we go. Is it okay? Great. Did you get any burns? No. Are you sure? I can show you my feet. Yeah, do that, please. So my feet don't have any burns. They are all a bit dirty, of course, but absolutely unharmed. I don't know what was scarier. The moment before my fingers went into the lead or standing on this path. One more thing. At the end of your run, you need to stomp it off. Like, very, very tightly. Because if there's any ember stuck to your feet, you need to stifle it with pressure. And when you run over the coals, you need to stomp really hard with a lot of force. And don't pay any attention to your feelings. That's it. I'm sorry, what feelings? Well, if you get some strong experience, don't hop around. Don't do any rush moves. Oh, God. No rushing. Be confident. Set yourself up for it. Be sure that you can do it. Yes, yes. <laughs> wow, honestly, I never thought that I could agree to something like that. Under any other circumstances, I would have said no. All the things you do for your show, I'll be damned. Unbelievable. Now you know what you're capable of. Yeah, I have this strange buzz of of adrenaline energy yes i guess it's adrenaline <laughs> Limits are always hard to find. Today, I found my own limits of mental strength and, I guess, fire resistance. Sasha, thank you so much. It was really awesome. By the way, do you have anything for burns?
Today we are going to find the strength limits of a regular portable fan. He might have something like this at home. Now picture a situation. You are sitting at home reading a book. A fan is working next to you. And suddenly, inexplicably, instead of a nominal 220 volts, your power sockets get hit with 380 volts. If this were to happen in a movie, naturally the fan would start flying around your apartment, shredding everyone to pieces. But that's in the movies. How would a real fan behave when you push its limits? We are going to figure that out now. Well, a fan you might have, but this thing, unlikely. This is a step-up transformer that can give you up to 380 volts instead of the usual 220. And this is a regular multimeter that I will use to measure the voltage on our fan. Zero, and off we go. It will buzz a bit, but unfortunately we cannot do anything about it. Well, I don't see any changes. The fan keeps spinning, and it seems its rev rate doesn't change. Okay, now it stopped working. 275 volts. Okay, so what happened? Oh, we have smoke coming out of it. It looks like the engine burnt out. Apparently, Chinese manufacturers took care of customer safety. And if your neighbor mixes up live and neutral wires, nothing terrible will happen. At most, you will be left without a fan. But it won't kill anyone, that's for sure. Nonetheless, we are going to find out what is the maximum rev rate you can get out of a fan. And to do that, I need an angle grinder. We are going to find out how fast it can make the blades of this fan spin. To be honest, I'm somewhat scared to hold this thing when it starts spinning at its maximum rev rate. That's why I'm going to attach it to the remains of our fan. Well, it seems to be secured. Next, I want to check the RPM of the fan. I have an optical tachometer for that. The only catch with this device is that it registers any flickering, including the one of the gas discharge lamps that are lighting this room. That's why, for the experiment, we will have to turn off all the lights except for the lamps with constant even light. Turn them off! Before I start spinning the fan's blades, I'm going to put on a hard hat, just in case. Right now, the grinder is running on 30 volts, so it's not rotating very fast. Let's increase the voltage. 50 volts. volts. Wow. Don't ever try this at home. I think this is an awesome result. Roughly 3,700 RPMs is the limit of a regular household fan. We have found its breaking point.